Attention, everybody. The views and opinions expressed on this show are not necessarily those of Axe Ministry, Axe Media Group, and or their affiliate and subordinate ministries and or nonprofits. So without any further ado, here he is to talk about what police know. It's crime time with Dr. Steve Albrecht. Take it away. Thanks, Producer Matt. Thanks, Producer Jay. Welcome to Crime Time. This is Crime Time episode, podcast episode 65. I'm Dr. Steve Albrecht, joining you, as always, from the new Axe Media Group studios in Springfield, Missouri. So welcome, everybody. For this hour, I'll be talking about an article I wrote with another San Diego cop way back in 1987. It's called What Cops Know and Do and Say. This is 34 years ago that I wrote this piece, and it still works today. Still in play today, the things that cops deal with and the things that cops encounter in the field. Some of it's horribly sad. Some of it's terrifically funny. We'll talk about that a little bit. So thanks for listening to Crime Time, where we talk about crime and crooks and cops and personal security, your personal security. And we talk about some dangerous people and lots of heroes, and we'll even mention a few stupid crooks, one of my favorite parts of the show. Most importantly, I'll talk about what you need to do to keep yourself safe and your family safe from crime and violence. As always, you need to be vigilant at home and at work and in your neighborhood and at school and in your community and even on the road. This show exists to make you feel more empowered and more secure and more educated in this difficult world we're living in on security issues and the criminal justice system. As background, I worked for the San Diego Police Department for 15 years as a patrol officer, a reserve sergeant, and a domestic violence investigator. I handled 1,500 domestic violence cases in six years there. I now work as a training consultant, teach training workshops focusing on human resources and employee coaching, workplace violence prevention, security issues at work. I've written 24 books on business and workplace violence and police subjects and guns, all of which you can find on Amazon. My three gun books are available on Amazon Kindle. I've written a couple of other books on Amazon Kindle as well that you can take a look at. Uh, one is called Stay Safe at Work, which I talked about last week. You can always reach me at my website, crimetimeradio.com, where we uh, can send me an email, we can connect and talk on LinkedIn, or we can connect and talk on Twitter as well. Uh, LinkedIn, Steve Albrecht, Dr. Steve Albrecht, you'll find me. And also on Twitter at Dr. Steve Albrecht, A-L-B-R-E-C-H-T. You can find past episodes of the show on SoundCloud for the audio version, and you can always go to my YouTube page for the YouTube versions as well. I want to start out by uh, saying a sad uh, reminder to myself how horrible last year was as we enter the new year now. In 2021, my good friend and police partner Richard Garcia passed away uh, last Friday from uh, Thursday from covid he had battled it uh, for about three weeks in the hospital here in Springfield, and he passed away. I loved him. I miss him. Uh, we had a little bit of a memorial for him yesterday at one of his favorite restaurants. And uh, I worked with him for, uh, from 1990 to 95. We were good friends from, from that point forward into the, all the way to the end of his life. I miss him. Uh, he knows how I felt about him when he passed away. He knew exactly how I felt about him. His family loved him and his wife and kids, and we will carry on his legacy and his memory, and we will take care of his family. I also want to review uh, kind of what we did last year on the show. We had a lot of interesting guests, people that came and talked about some interesting things on the telephone, and some folks came live into the studio and talked. First episode I did back in, in uh, August, which is episode 43, was what do the police need to do differently in the world that we're living in now. So we talked about kind of the police um, modality in the Black Lives Matter and then the defund the police and all the anti-police you know, hatred that's coming out in, in really was happening in the midsummer. Uh, we talked about that in August. I talked about the prison interviews that I did with three workplace violence murderers. I interviewed Scott DeCry, who killed eight people in Seal Beach, California. I interviewed um, Robert Back, who killed two people at General Dynamics in San Diego, and I interviewed um, a guy who killed two people at a, at a um, power company in San Diego as well. And so those are my prison interviews. That was episode 44. Episode 45, I talked about suicides and suicidality. Uh, people especially that, that have suicide concerns, if you own a lot of guns and you're having mental health issues, what do we do about that? Uh, my friend Mary Beth Wilkes Janke was on uh, episode 46 to talk about her book, The Protector. You can find the book, The Protector, on Amazon. It's really a cool read. It's about her time in the Secret Service, and she was a diplomatic um, um, agent in, in uh, Colombia and in working in South America. Really interesting stuff in her book there. 
47 had uh, Tim Keck. He's a, a church security expert, a former police chief in Arkansas, and he came in to talk about church security and what we need to do. In 48, um, I talked about domestic violence at home and also domestic violence in the workplace and what we need to do as employers to keep our employees safe. Episode 49 talked about home security and home security devices, cameras, you know, simply safe, things like that you may be thinking about for your own, your own house. Uh, I recommend that at least lighting and landscaping and, and a good exterior camera system, especially for your porch and entrance areas is useful. And uh, we talked about that. Episode 50 talked about road rage, which I'm working on a book on road rage. I'm hoping to get that done by the summertime this year. We talked about the issues of road rage and how it continues to be a one of those hidden subjects in our world these days. Episode 51, I had Kathleen Griggs on. She's uh, the CEO of a company called Data Buoy. Uh, Data Buoy is a shot spotter. They make a software program that listens for gunshots. We install these at churches, at schools, in public places so that the police know exactly what, what and when a shooting takes place, they can get dispatched to it uh, as fast as possible. Episode 52, I uh, had Frederick Lane on. He's an author and an attorney in New York. Frederick, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K, Frederick Lane. He talked about cyber stalking and cyber crimes and s cyber exposure that we have for our kids and how to keep them safe. Episode 53, I talked about Cop in Your Pocket, which is an app I'm, I'm working on with my friend Robert Smith, who's a retired San Diego police officer as well. Cop in Your Pocket is going to be a collection, if we can get it off the ground, a collection of of facts and information about security and police things and like you know what do I do for a loud party and how do I get somebody out of jail who's on bail and things like that we're gonna have that app uh, next year as this year as well episode 54 we talked about gangs and gang uh, intervention with Arthur Soriano who's a former gang member in San Diego episode 55 I talked with my friend John Cowling John is a um, security expert international security expert and he lives in Dubai we talked about the culture of Dubai and what it's like to be a security guy there. Episode 56, we talked with my friend Ryan Dowd. Uh, Ryan runs a place called Hesed House, H-E-S-E-D, uh, -E Hesed um, House, uh, dot org. So H-E-S-E-D, Hesed House, dot org, is a um, homeless shelter in uh, Aurora, Illinois. If you want to make a contribution to his efforts there, he would appreciate it. He's doing valuable work there for the homeless. Uh, 57, we talked with Dave Fowler. Dave is in uh, Idaho. He runs a personal safety uh, training uh, company, which is um, taking uh, uh, self-defense programs and classes and instruction to hospitals, casinos, workplaces, things like that. Uh, episode 58, we talked about The Green Wall with DJ Vodica, his book about the corruption system in the California state uh, prison system where he worked as a prison guard. Uh, episode 59, we talked with Ken Blanchard. He's the founder of the website Black Man with a Gun. We talked about race and guns and his work to to kind of educate people about guns in the world that that he's uh, doing training and, and helping people in range situations and he's a big nra uh, supporter as well uh, fi episode 59 we talked with ziggy Siegfried. mike Siegfried is the um, coo of verbaljudo.org uh, verbal judo is uh, a training program for um, de-escalation and high-risk communication so go take a look at verbal judo online and get the book that was written by dr george thompson so many years ago Episode 61, we talked with Carl Hirschman. He was a former um, sex crimes detective with San Diego PD about keeping uh, the people in our lives, especially the women in our lives, safe from sexual assault. Uh, episode 62, we talked with former FBI agent Chris Holland about what, what it's like to be an FBI agent and how to get to be an FBI agent, what the process is. Episode 63, we talked about if I was a crook, here's some of the things that I would do to be a successful criminal. Episode 64 talked about our my new workplace safety book called Stay Safe at Work, Your Ultimate Guide to Workplace Security. And then today we'll talk about what cops know. I did this um, article for the reader in San Diego. I wrote it with a guy named Roy Huntington. Roy Huntington was um, a cop in San Diego, and he was also a writer, and he went on after he retired in the PD to uh, edit uh, national um, uh, gun magazines, and he just uh, retired in August um, from uh, um, editing and publishing a, a national gun magazine, which continues on e even in his retirement. So everything about guns that I know uh, has come from Roy. His uh, knowledge of guns is extensive. So we wrote this piece in 1987, 34 years ago, for the reader. The San Diego Reader is still exists. 
I think it's probably been in business since maybe the 70s. It's, it's probably been around for 50 years in San Diego. It's a weekly publication that comes out free. It's, uh, I, I don't know if you'd call it a counterculture um, publication. It's a newspaper. It's, it's, um, you know, we, it's given away free in newspaper boxes and newsstands, and people get it at the gym and th places like that. And it's been around for a long time. It, it sort of has a liberal bent to it. So I, I was surprised that they took the piece that we offered, which was we talked about in a collection of stories, and it was a pretty substantial article, a collection of stories about what cops know. And so what we said was cops love to talk about their work. They can't get enough war stories, either their own or ones that they hear from other cops. Their talk is frequently impulsive and sad and heartwarming. It's also earthy, and it often reeks of the here and now. There's little time to uh, think about police approved restraining methods when somebody's trying to stab you in an alley fight. Cops tell stories that are full of descriptions, emotions, survival techniques, and bravado that few civilians understand or even agree with. Uh, a good majority of the time, cop talk is funny. As most uh, stand-up comics will tell you, people and their problems can be quite entertaining. So cops love to talk, but only to a selected audiences, spouses, friends, and beer buddies. But for the most time, they, get, um, they talk about their issues and their problems and their solutions with other cops, the only other logical audience. So police work is deadly and demanding and demeaning and dull. The expression, hours of boredom followed by minutes of terror, was coin coined by and for police officers, and few jobs expose a normal human being to so many negative sides of life. What other job gives you nightmares? The vocabulary of police work is almost like a foreign language. Cops talk in terms of penal codes and radio codes and street slangs, and every cop in his or her city knows that when someone starts out with a story that says, I stopped this real dirt bag the other night, everybody knows what that means. Cops are um, always taking citizens on ride-alongs, and I encourage you, if you think about um, wanting to either get into law enforcement or your, your, your son or daughter wants to, uh, going on a ride-along is a great way to get them exposed to the, to the, the, the work and the profession and the people that work in that profession and see the process. And so everybody I've ever met in my life who wanted to be a cop and went through the process has went through a ride-along at least once or twice or even three times. Um, I did two myself um, just to get a sense of what the job is about. And so citizens, when they go on ride-alongs, they're always amazed to hear the constant chatter and the crackle of the radio and how do you keep it all straight? How do you talk and look around and see things and still operate the car? And the answer is you get used to it. I still remember my radio ID. I still remember my, my uh, police number ID just like it was yesterday and it's been over 30 years. So when you think about what cops know and what they say and what they do and what they get exposed to, here's a collection of stories that came out almost 35 years ago. Sometimes little kids come up to you and point at your gun and s ask if you're going to shoot them. Imagine that. I forget how the call came out, but there was some kind of disturbance. We went out in there and... I got a whole. I got there to find a whole bunch of people backing away from something that was in the street. As I got there, I saw this skunk running in circles, spraying everybody as much as he could, spraying everything in sight. It's got this plastic Yo Play yogurt cup stuck on its head, and it can't see anything. It's really, really mad. By now, the whole neighborhood stinks of skunk juice, and one of the cops near me is watching the scene and then waiting. When he finally fi figures that the skunk has run out of spray, he calmly leans over and plucks the yogurt cup off its head. The skunk, lo skunk looks up at him for a few seconds sort of thanks him and then runs off. I laughed all the way to my next call. Quiet residential neighborhoods have the most multiple homicides. That's still true today, isn't it? It's always the quiet guy, right? And whenever the neighbors get interviewed by the FBI or, or the cops about some guy that they turn out to be a serial killer, they always say the same thing. He was a quiet man. He kept to himself, kept his lawn short, but we didn't see much of him. That's because bad people that are really doing bad things don't draw attention to themselves. They don't want to be caught and stopped. They engage in stealth behaviors, whereas most, sp most idiot crooks are sporadic and, and larger than life and you know, obnoxious, and that's how we catch them. So in this article, the cop says, I broke my back chasing a guy across a railroad bridge. I fell off the bridge and landed on the railroad ties. My adrenaline was pumping so hard I didn't feel it. I got up and continued to chase the guy. I finally caught him, and then I felt the pain. I couldn't even handcuff him. It hurt so bad. I sat on him until my cover units arrived. I was in the hospital for four months. People kill themselves in the strangest ways. One guy drove his car off a cliff and shot himself on the way down. That may st must take some amount of nerve to be able to kill yourself on the way to killing yourself. You can be on patrol in a deserted neighborhood at 3 in the morning and see some guy walking all by himself. When you pull up next to him and you say, hey, I want to talk to you, he'll invariably turn around and say, who, me? That always happens. 
I was working a prisoner transport unit one night downtown. Some other officers stopped a drunk in the street when I came to take him to our, our city detox center. That's a place where they can go and dry out for four hours. It's not jail, but they're not allowed to leave. Uh, it's basically a place to sober up. I came to take him to the detox center. His shirt had some blood on it, and he said he'd been fighting with another homeless guy. I didn't think much about it since those guys are always fighting. I dropped him off at detox, and I finished my shift. The next morning, homicide called me at home, woke me up to ask about the guy. He'd stabbed another guy to death only minutes before the first unit had stopped him for public drunkenness. We made this drug bust. The guy who called us said he was tired of the drug dealers in the neighborhood, and even little kids on bicycles were playing, let's do a drug deal. Can you believe it? He said that even they knew the right terminology and were asking each other how much rock cocaine cost and heroin cost. We took six people out of a house for selling heroin and crack cocaine in an apartment 10 feet from where the kids were playing. Whenever you are talking to a group of people, gang members or surfers or kids on bicycles or whoever, they always say, why are you picking on us all the time? They don't seem to understand that we aren't. We talk to everyone all day long and all night long. That's all we do is talk to people and look for things to talk to people about. Taxi drivers always fight their tickets. That's uh, a true statement as well. Uh, my partner and I responded to a call where a man had been shot six times in a neighborhood apartment. We get there, and there's a big guy in a T-shirt, and he answers the door, and he invites us in. He's sitting there drinking a beer, and we asked him about the shooting. He said, yes, there's a shooting, and I'm the victim. He pulled up his shirt, and he showed us six twenty-five caliber bullet holes in his stomach. I guess all that fat saved him. One of the stupidest things I ever saw was a cop reading the Miranda admonishment. You know that from TV. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used in court against you. Um, I saw this cop reading the Miranda warning to three eight-year-old kids who had thrown rocks through this woman's window and broke her plate glass window in the back of her house. It wasn't the officer's fault. You have to read it to everybody that's a juvenile, but it sure looked ridiculous to see these kids standing there and listen to all that legal mumbo-jumbo. They're eight years old. They don't even know what an attorney is. That's the way our system is set up. I found this woman dead on the floor of her house. She had died next to a space heater. It was cold that winter, and she had laid there for 10 days. I vomited. The coroner vomited. The guys who showed up from the coroner's office in the ambulance vomited. I guess those guys have seen it all, but he, even the, the body uh, peop people that pick up the bodies feel it now and then. I stopped this drunk driver one night, and the driver and his passenger looked a little creepy, so I was careful not to lean into the car too much as I talked to him. I talked to him kind of from the, you know, over the shoulder, not too close to them. I got the driver out of the car and put him in between me and the passenger, and I, as I gave him the field sobriety test, my cover unit arrived and walked up to the passenger side of the car. The passenger, who never took his eyes off me, didn't even see the other officer approach and, and open his door. My cover officer saw that the passenger was pointing a 9mm pistol at me inside the car. He grabbed the gun and we arrested both guys. I found out later that these guys had just murdered someone in Los Angeles and were headed to Mexico. The driver told me if his his friend uh, told me his friend would have shot me if he'd had a clear shot. Thank God I never gave him one. I arrested a guy once for operating his private plane while under the influence of alcohol. So you can fly while drunk and get arrested for it. You can ride a bicycle and get arrested for it. You can uh, for being drunk and you can also operate a boat and get drunk and be arrested for drunk driving. My partner and I went to a check the welfare call. These things usually turn out two ways. Somebody is dead or on vacation. On this particular night, we went to the Sarge apartment complex, and we found uh, the friend of this very old man waiting for us outside his door. <coughs> he uh, was worried because he hadn't heard from his friend in several days, and that was quite unusual. We tried to get into the apartment, uh, but it was a high-security building with good locks, and the manager lived on the other side of town, and, and his friend didn't have a key. So finally, we got a supervisor's permission to kick in the door, and as soon as I came crashing in, I saw this man laying on the floor and bleeding hard from his head. When he heard us come in, he raised his head slightly as if to speak, then he just died. I felt sure he had been heard us talking outside the door, and he just couldn't hold on, uh, on any longer, and I felt horrible that we couldn't come in in, si in time to rescue and save him. One night on the beach, my partner and I get this check the welfare of a cat call. We thought somebody was pulling our leg, and we laughed all the way to the address. This guy meets us out front and says his cat is trapped inside his neighbor's house. His cat is trapped inside his neighbor's house. The neighbor's on vacation. We go upstairs, and he taps on the window and calls the cat's name, and sure enough, the cat appears, meowing his head off and looking afraid. We couldn't legally break into the house just to get the cat. No landlord was in sight. We told the man to wait one more day and then do what he had to, and then told him to, to do what he thought he had to do to get the cat out. 
I felt bad about the poor cat mewing at us from inside the stranger's house, and I never did find out if the guy got his cat back. That's the trouble with this job. You never hear what happens after you leave. I remember one time uh, I was at a major crash scene. We thought we had found all the bodies, and I was going through a pile of clothes on the floor on one of the cars when I found a baby doll. I sh thought it sure looked real, and I reached down to pick it up, and I realized it was a dead baby, not a baby doll. It hadn't been in a car seat, and it was thrown against the windshield during the crash. I see that baby's face every time I see a child's doll. I went to a jumper call on the Coronado Bridge. That's a bridge in San Diego that crosses from San Diego to Coronado Island. There's a Navy base over there where the SEAL teams trained, et cetera. It's a beautiful blue bridge if you ever see the pictures. They're actually putting uh, new lights on it, I think, this year, uh, which look quite nice. Um, I went to a jumper call on the Coronado Bridge. I got there just to in time to see the uh, older man put his driver's license and wallet on the hood of his car and jump off. I looked over the side and saw him floating face up in the water. His arms were folded across his chest just like he was lying in a coffin, and it was eerie. One of the most disturbing calls I ever went to involved a swimming pool with a three-year-old boy and his pregnant mother. She was talking on the phone and looked over to see the kid's big wheel, the little tricycle, floating in the pool with the kid at the bottom. She was eight months pregnant and couldn't swim. She jumped in the pool and sank like a stone. Some neighbors saw the whole thing and called the paramedics. I got there to see the mom and the son in the pool. Who do I save? I jumped in the pool in full uniform and grabbed the kid first. I couldn't move the mother. She was just too heavy. The department, fire department arrived and pulled the mother out of the water, and both of them had died at the scene. People have no sympathy or compassion for our cops anymore. I had to shoot this German shepherd that actually bit me on the thigh. I had sh shot the dog as it was biting me on the thigh. Its head was wrapped around my thigh muscle. I didn't want to do it. I have dogs myself, but the dog kept attacking me. People in the neighborhood kept calling me dog killer and all kinds of pleasant stuff like that. It still bothers me, even after all these years, to have a motorist ask, what, don't you have anything better to do than give me a ticket? I always tell them I would rather be catching a murderer or a rapist, but writing tickets is also part of my job, and if they wouldn't speed, I could get back to catching real criminals. They never seem to understand that. I remember a friend of mine said, every time when you ask somebody how fast they're going, when you stop them for speeding, they always look at the dashboard and they always look at the speedometer, and it's always set at zero because the car is parked. That's a human nature thing. Uh, people always give us the big eyeball when we go into restaurants. You can hear them talking with each other. Does he have to pay for his food? Does she get that for free? I pay for my stuff just like everyone else. We don't get free food. Shift work is hell in your life. Second watch, it seems like you're always getting ready to go to work. On Graveyard, which starts at 9 o'clock at night, you're always sleeping. your sleeping schedule gets incredibly messed up. I've, kept, I've come home at 7 in the morning, slept till 7 p.m., 8 showered, and went back to work at 9 p.m., dead tired. My ha family hates graveyard because most of the time because I'm tired all the time. On my days off, I can sleep seven normal hours, but I'm usually wide awake watching TV at 3.30 in the morning. We responded to a call about a loud woman raising a fuss in a bar. Sure enough, when we got there, we could hear her clear down the street yelling from inside the bar. We went inside, and we saw this woman perched on the bar stool yelling and cursing. My partner and I got her by the arms and started to lift her off the stool when we noticed she didn't have any legs. She kept screaming. We took her out to the car and put her in the back seat. When we got back to the central station, we went into the watch commander's uh, office to tell him about the arrest for disturbing the peace and public drunkenness. She continued to yell and curse at us the whole time. The watch commander got upset and told us to bring the prisoner into his office so he could tell her to shut up. We carried her by the arms and plucked her right on his desk. She never missed a beat and kept going on with her foul mouth commentary about all of us and life in general. You should have seen the watch commander's face. In 1984, a guy went into the McDonald's in San Ysidro, a guy named James Huberty, and he killed 21 people with an assault weapon and a handgun, a series of handguns. He was killed by our SWAT team, a guy named Chuck Foster. Uh, fired the shot that, that killed him finally, but not until after he had, had done this massacre. At that time in 1984, this was uh, July of 84, I'd been a cop about eight whole days in the academy, and he, um, uh, Huberty, the San Ysidro McDonald's, was in the last uh, San Diego city before you cross into Mexico and before you cross into Tijuana. It's a border town called San Ysidro. Uh, Huberty went in there and, and killed these people, 21 people, and a lot of cops responded to that. Um, situation, obviously. It was the worst mass murder in the history of the United States at that time. I was at the San Ysidro McDonald's after Huberty killed 21 people inside. I stood outside the door after looking at the kids and the parents dead on the floor next to where Huber Huberty's body was handcuffed. 
I also almost had to stifle myself from telling them to go in and it was all over and they could get up and go on with their lives now. I talked to some people who went to that scene and they said the people looked like mannequins, like wax wax figures, like a movie set. Uh, it didn't look like a real thing, but obviously it was. I almost shot some idiot on the beach one night. My partner and I were looking for a parolee pro who had escaped from some narcotics detectives. We were walking along the, the boardwalk and we saw a guy uh, lying on a blanket trying to look <coughs> unobtrusive. We walked over to talk to him because he matched the description. When he saw us, he stood up and he turned his back on us and he pulled this black blanket over his head. So now he's got his back to us and he's got this blanket over his head. I pulled my gun and told him to turn around. He swiveled towards us and he shoved both of his hands into his waistband. I saw him grab something shiny, which I took to be a chrome-plated gun. I was just about to pull the trigger to shoot him when something told me to stop. He pulled a pint scotch bottle out of his waistband and threw it on the sand. I was so mad I couldn't stop yelling at him. I nearly shot a guy who was mostly worried about getting a ticket for having a bottle on the beach. When little kids come up to me, this is my favorite story from the whole, whole collection here. Uh, we got these from about 40 cops that we talked to to write the article. When little kids come up to me, they always say, hello, officer. I always say, hello, citizen, you know, just like Batman used to do on the old TV show. It makes me laugh. I got a call one time to take a report, and the dispatcher said, take a report concerning a stolen house. I asked the dispatcher if she meant a theft from a house, and she said, no, somebody stole a house. I got there, and sure enough, somebody had stolen a house. I got there and saw that somebody had backed a a trailer truck and uh, a truck and a trailer up to this house that was on on uh, lifts and removed it from the lot during the night. Can you believe that? Somebody stole an entire house. I can't tell you the number of times I pulled out drunks who have drowned. People start partying and suddenly it seems like a good idea to go for a swim in the pool or a fountain or in the ocean and sure enough one of them will drown. It happens quite a lot. I always hate to go to what are called 1183s. Those are no detail accidents. It could be a fender bender or it could be a fatal. You just never know until you get there. One night about 2 in the morning, we were en route to another call. When we get this 1183, it comes out. We were about a block away, so we went to check. As we approached the scene, I saw this mangled bicycle and a crumpled human figure laying on the side of the road. We jumped out and ran over to the guy. According to some witnesses, he had been walking his bike because it had a flat tire along the side of the road when someone hit him. As he fell, another car hit him and another car hit him again. So he was run over by three different cars and not one driver bothered to stop to see if he was still alive. By the time we got there, he was already dying. The paramedics worked on him, but he was dead. I still shudder every time I drive past that stretch of road. For a brief, brief instant, every time I drive past, past that road, I can see him lying there with all those cars just going right on by next to his bicycle. The people that are always the most understanding and apologetic when you give them a ticket, a driving, you know, a speeding ticket or a hazardous citation, are always the first ones to fight them in court. The five cops are at a scene, the one with the least amount of time on the job usually ends up doing the report. Cops do a lot of stuff based on seniority. So the big issue in police work is not what your badge number is, because those change all the time, but your ID number. Your ID number and your badge number in lot most agencies are not the same. People change badge numbers all the time for various reasons, but um, your ID number stays the same no matter what. So if your ID number is 3608 and somebody else is 3610, they, they get the report since you're two ID numbers ahead of them in terms of seniority, and that happens in law enforcement all the time. The urge to sleep on graveyard shift is very powerful. You feel like a zombie. You feel like a cloud is hanging over your head. Sometimes at 4 in the morning, it's all you can do to keep from falling asleep at the wheel and crashing your patrol car. Some cops do crash, and when they do, they say they were either chasing a prowler or something like that, or they always come up with the black Labrador, ran in the middle of the road, and I slammed on the brakes and swerved and hit a car. Everybody really knows what happened. Some guy was driving down the freeway at 65 miles an hour when he suddenly put a 22 pistol to his head and shot himself. The car went careening out of control and finally crashed. At least he didn't kill anyone else, but he shot himself driving at 65 miles an hour, and thank God nobody else died. A lot of times, especially when this happens at restaurants, parents will point at you and then tell their kids, if you don't behave, that policeman will get you. Or they say, if you don't eat your vegetables, that policeman will write you a ticket or get you. I always hate that. I carry little badge stickers that I give to the kids when their parents say that, and I always bend down and tell them right in front of their parents that I won't get them, and their parents shouldn't say that to them, which makes them quite mad. 
We're, I tell you why we're not popular these days, and this this comment comes from 19, um, 1987 when we wrote this till now, and it's still true today. I tell you why we're not too popular today. That's uh, because we're in the public control business, and you put that in capitals, the public control business. We have to enforce laws and tell people not to do things they think they have a right to do. Turn down your radio, sign this ticket, stop beating your wife, don't walk around drunk, stop taking drugs, leave this other person's property alone, don't drink and drive. Stop stealing stuff, stop sexually assaulting people. It's all the same. People hate being told what to do even though they know they are wrong and shouldn't do it. I used to know this old timer. Uh, he had been on the force for about 30 years. He was still working as a patrol cop. Whenever a citizen would get on his case, the cop would just shake his head and say, I don't have an answer for you. I just don't have an answer for you. Just about the time when you think you've seen everything and have it all figured out, something new will come along and hit you right in the face. It doesn't matter how long you've been on the job. You can't even begin to see it all, not even a little. So that is a collection of stories from about 40 cops in from the San Diego Reader magazine from 1987, a piece I wrote with Roy Huntington back uh, 34 years ago. And most of the stuff in this piece, a few cor corrections in terms of of uh, what was illegal now is probably not, or what was illegal back then is probably not illegal now, especially in California when it comes to stuff like drugs. Uh, everything else is exactly the same. And if you pulled 30 cops out of the average big city in, in, in any town in this country and sat them down and said, give me your best and worst stories in your, your top, top two or three best stories, your top two or three worst stories, your top two or three funniest stories, they would have a collection very similar to these. So it always amazes me how more things change the more they stay the same. So let's talk about Crime Time's Stupidest Crook of the Week. One of my favorite parts of the show, Crime Time's Stupidest Crook of the Week, where we get to talk about some of our dumbest criminals who managed to get themselves arrested based on their monumental stupidity. An accused porch pirate has been arrested. Everyone knows porch pirates, right? They steal gifts and presents and boxes from people's front porches. Has been arrested after wearing the exact same shirt that he was caught on video the very next day to a South Carolina courtroom. So he wore that same shirt to steal pe people's packages from their porches, and then he wore the same shirt in court. So the video and the photographs match the shirt he was wearing at the time. What a coincidence. Kind of like uh, O.J. Simpson and the matching Bruno Mali shoes, allegedly. The series of events began after a picture of the man in a green and red North Face shirt was posted to the Groose Creek resident group on Facebook by somebody claiming that he had stolen packages that had been left on the porches in the neighborhood. Beware of this porch pirate, the social media post began. This was around noon today. Notice the empty Amazon package in his hand. It's something he stole off a neighbor's porch and threw the empty package in my trash can, then stole the package off my porch, all on camera, stuffed it into his backpack with whatever else he had stolen in the neighborhood. He's the second person. He's with the second person. They're both on bicycles, and the police have been notified. However, an announcement posted to Facebook by the Goose Creek Police Department. That's a pr I like to see their patches for Goose Creek. The Goose Creek Police Department authorities confirmed that the man had been arrested after appearing in a courtroom the very next day wearing the exact same shirt he had been pictured on while stealing the same items off the residential porches. Remember seeing this post, said the Goose Creek Police Department? Well, sometimes people actually do make our job easier. This guy decided to come into our courtroom the day after the first post was made, and lucky for us, he was wearing the exact same shirt. We're happy to say he's in custody for theft and burglary. So that's our stupid crook of the week. Let's test your Crime Time IQ with this week's crime quiz question. This is an interesting story here. Who worked for the Los Angeles Police Department the longest amount of time? There is a cop that worked for the LAPD for the longest amount of time in LAPD history. And LAPD started in you know the 18 whatever, 1880s or whatever, and exists today as one of the largest police departments in the United States. I think they're number two to New York, of course. So who worked for the LAPD the longest amount of time? And so there was a cop in Los Angeles who worked for LAPD for 51 years, and his name was Jigsaw John. That was his uh, nickname. And John St. John uh, held the highest seniority in the history of Los Angeles with 51 years of service. Um, he came on the job in 1942 uh, and retired in 1993, and he had badge number, LAPD detective badge number one. You can look him up on Wikipedia and on Google. Um, there was a TV show about him that ran, I think, in the uh, 80s. Uh, very interesting guy. He solved a number of homicides. 
Uh, he was one of those old school homicide detectives with the fedora hats. He was kind of a portly looking guy, not didn't look like a TV homicide detective like the ones we see on NCIS and things like that with the with the abs and the muscles. But he was a very empathic guy, and he was one of those guys that just knew everybody in the street, and everybody knew him. He knew every snitch and crook and informant and bad guy and prostitute and drug dealer, and those helped him solve a number of homicides. And he actually worked on the famous Black Dahlia case. And so if you want to research him on, on uh, Wikipedia, he's an interesting guy. So born in February 1918, died in May 1995. So he died two years after he had finished working 51 years for the Los Angeles Police Department, worked on some of their most highest uh, notoriety, highest ranking um, uh, detective that they had, badge number LAPD, detective badge number one. So look him up, John St. John, or otherwise known as Jigsaw John. So this week's crime time safety tip, this, this week's tip is not is all about not leaving your firearms, if you carry firearms, if you have a concealed weapons permit, in your car, even when it's parked in your garage. So you say, well, I'm just going to leave my gun in here. It's in a holster. It's on the front seat. Or I have it stuffed in the usual hiding places, which is, you know, the glove compartment or under the seat or under the passenger seat or in the back seat covered by a blanket or in the center console. That's where people always leave their guns. Well, guess what? Crooks break into garages all the time. They come into garages because oftentimes people leave the the entry or exit door of the garage, not the actual garage door, but the entry or exit door open. And so at nighttime, folks come right in there. If your garage is detached, that's, a, that's one thing you need to keep locked. Um, sometimes they get into the garage door by simply prying it open with a car jack. They will put a crowbar under it and bend the aluminum door up. They weigh about 400 pounds. And they'll put a jack in there and, and jack it up and be able to come inside your garage that way. If they get inside your car, they can steal uh, anything that's inside there, including your gun. So never leave your guns inside your car overnight, especially, and you know this to be true, people do it anyway, don't leave your guns in your car when the car is parked outside overnight. Another stupid thing to do because people break into cars all the time looking for whatever they can steal, firearms, money, um, prescription pills, anything that you have in there that's worth something, including clothing, jackets, stuff like that, they will steal. So. When I put my car in our garage and it's unattached, unattached to the house, I lock it. And so in order for them to break into my car, they got to break into my garage first, then break into my car, and that's usually going to make a fair amount of noise. Never leave your firearm in your car if it is unoccupied with the keys in it, even for a few seconds. This idea of running into the – and I just saw it at the gas station this morning. A guy goes inside the, the convenience store while he's getting gas for his truck, and it's running – you never do that. It's just a perfect invitation for somebody to stand outside the convenience store or the coffee shop, the post office, wherever, and, and drive off with your car and then your gun. Also, you never want to leave a firearm in a car with somebody else in the car, especially children, and you should know that already. So if you have a, a concealed carry permit and you're allowed to carry in your state, then keep your gun at home and not in your car, not stored. Crooks know all the best places to store a gun inside a car and think about the places you go, well, you know, I covered it with a floor mat. How could they have possibly found it? If you have to, think about where you want to store your gun inside your car if you have to leave it because let's say you go to your workplace and there's no way for you to store it at home or store it someplace safely. The usual places that crooks look at under the seats, under the floor mats, in the center console, in the glove compartment, you could say, well, I put it in the in the trunk with the spare tire next to the jack and the spare tire. They look there as well. So if you have no choice but to store your gun in your car for some span of time, make sure first no child of any age can get into your car or get access to it. And, and if your gun is inside, think of a creative place, a creative hiding place to store your gun. Maybe you put it in an old pizza box, which is in the back seat. Maybe you put it in a bag of existing trash. Just remember not to throw out that that bag. So when you think about keeping your gun safe, your car is not a good storage place for it, especially overnight. So thanks for listening to this episode of Crime Time. I encourage you to go to my website at crimetimeradio.com, crimetimeradio.com. Send me an email with questions or topics you want me to cover on future shows. Connect with me on LinkedIn and follow me on Twitter at Dr. Steve Albrecht. Next week's show, we will talk about terrorism awareness. I've got an interesting um, document that came from the states and the feds, which is kind of that if you see something, say something 
um, document, and there's about 15 or so different uh, warning signs for terrorism, domestic terrorism, and, and international terrorism in, on our shores that we can look at to help protect our um, kids and our neighborhoods and ourselves and our workplaces, and also that we can do to help the feds and to help the local cops. So when you see things like see something, say something, we'll talk about what those things actually are. In our world, there are sheep and shepherds and wolves, and too many people are sheep and too few people are shepherds. There are a lot of wolves out there. There are not enough police officers or sheriff's deputies to protect us all, so you need to be a shepherd. Take care of yourself and protect your family and your loved ones and your friends and your coworkers. Pay attention. Be prepared to defend yourself with legal force if necessary. Be a good witness for the police if you see a crime. Stay safe and aware and alert at home, at work, at school, and even on the road. So thanks for listening to Crime Time. My thanks to Jim Wining, producer Matt, producer Jay, and all the good folks at Axe Media Group. I'm Steve Albrecht, and thanks for listening to What I Know is Right.